Welcome to this session, which is 137 on European power systems. My name is Pablo Frias. I'm senior researcher at, and professor at the ICAI School of Engineering in Madrid, Spain. And today I have the honor to chair this session that will take three papers uh, talking about Europe, talking about markets. So we will have uh, first a paper on market splitting for, from Germany to Berlin. Then we will move to flexibility systems in, in Europe with people from uh, Central Supelec. And finally, we will also have something linked with that, which is a topic on demand response in Europe uh, from Tiu Dresden. So remember for the speakers that you have uh, 20 minutes for the presentation, so be efficient on that. And in order to have a room for five minutes to have the Q&A. For the other attendants, basically we can use the chat to make the questions or wait until the end of the, of the presentation to raise the hand and to make the, uh, to make the questions at that time. So basically, the first paper we have has been, uh, as I mentioned before, by Q Berlin. So Alfredo, Christoph, welcome. Uh, so I leave the floor to you and you can start whenever you want. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Does it work? Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So we can see the presentation? Right, perfect. Okay, perfect. So we start right away. So um, I'd like to welcome all of you to our presentation today in Sonal Pricing in Germany, as is as labeled it, um, is it a preferable trade-off between nodal and uniform pricing? So um, let's start things off with our agenda. Um, I first gonna introduce our topic with a brief motivation. Then I will um, follow the methodology we use for this research. Then present you some preliminary results we already gotten and finish with a conclusion. And of course, hopefully we have still some time for a Q and A. So I wanna start the motivation with these two graphs. They're very interesting. So um, the upper graph, we see um, the share of renewable energy sources for Germany for the last 20 years, and including the target for the year 2030. So as we know in Germany, we have um, uh, the different generation uh, distributed alongside Germany. And since the grid has it's been built for, for another type of generation, we have um, uh, presented some uh, issues with congestion in the transmission lines. And this congestion has brought some, of course, it is brings some extra costs and extra costs means um, high electricity prices. So as of for today, the, uh, the way of, of the, the approach to handle this situation is to expand the grid and the, the transmission grid. So in the bottom graph, we see the expected expansion for the transmission grid for three target years. And as we see, um, uh, for example, in 2013, it was expected that by the year um, uh, 2019, already eight, um, 1,800 kilometers will be built. And as we can see in this graph, the situation has been delayed. So as the increment of energy, of renewable energy, uh, cannot accommodate the, or, or the grid cannot accommodate um, support the increment of renewable energies. So um, which other alternative do we have? So let's look at electricity markets. So in Germany, we have a single bidding zones for the, our electricity markets that we um, divide here into three phases. So we first start with the day ahead markets, which is a centralized electricity market without grid constraints, it's very important. And the market will be cleared by the merit order. This means um, low cost and renewable energy has priority to supply. 
And then there is a dispatch plan where suppliers determine the cost minimal dispatch of their power plants. And at the end, uh, the congestion management dealt by the um, transmission system operators that have to determine the grid compatible power flow. So they have to adjust conventional run um, generation, known as redispatch, or cut renewable generation, known as containment. So we see in the bottom graph the increment of in redispatch cost. And the question is what can electricity markets do to, um, or what can they add to solve this problem? Next, please. Perfect. So, as we say, we have in Germany a uh, single market. So, this means that all providers from the country compete in one centralized market, just market, and it is assumed an unlimited trading capacity. This means that um, regarding where the, gener um, the generation point or the generation area of the electricity, it can be sold at any point uh, of, the, of the country um, without any acknowledgement of the electricity grid. So to solve this issue, we can split the market. And we have here two examples, uh, sonal and nodal markets. So for the sonal market, we simply split the country in several zones. And then we limit the exchange capacity within with the, between the zones. So this forces the, the zones that become their own independent electricity markets to provide for themselves. So the northern market, if we split these zones further and further and further, we came up with this distribution where each node in the grid becomes their, their own electricity market. And for this market or this type of markets, the and physical electricity grid is taken into consideration. So this is uh, why it's called sometimes the most efficient market, or also it's, you can see it adds a lot of complexity since all these markets have to be um, uh, managed simultaneously. And this, it's a, it's a problem in and of itself, yeah. So next one. So um, just to finish the motivation, I want to uh, take a look a little bit on the existing research on, on sonal markets. So we have, uh, we have identified three main topics for the sonal markets. So we have the sonal configuration, where this uh, type of research uh, search for optimal number of zones or optimal zones limits. We have short-term effects, where the sonal configuration is uh, is selected a specific one and then you look for how this specific design um, affect the market price or the congestion or redispatch and containment and lastly we have long-term effects um, where these short-term effects are evaluated over time and also the impact of investment in the future so our research centers on short-term effects and we give special or we pay special attention and variation of trading capacity between the zones. So to um, talk a little, bit up, a little bit about the methodology we use for this project. Um, first, we have to uh, define a sonal design. So, um, we, uh, after conducting some research, of course, we came up with this um, paper um, published by Weipitzan and Egera in 2016. And they uh, use an iterative approach. So it, um, this is followed by some steps. We first analyzed the electricity grid structure to determine some bottlenecks. Then we draw on these bottlenecks the, the sonal borders. Then we run a simulation to determine the effects of sonal configuration. And then we optimize the sonal delimitation. So at the beginning, they were all squares. And then they took shapes um, depending on how do we want to optimize the, the design of the zones. And the data we use for, the, for this uh, simulation was um, for, the high, for the extra high voltage grid was taken from Promato and more about that um, next slide. 
but um, then at the at the end we came up with this zonal configuration, this zonal design, where we split the market in five different zones: uh, northwest, northeast, west, east, and south. And uh, next. Exactly. So now we deal with the in, uh, with the trading capacity. So the intrazonal trading capacity, or as we call it, ITC, is the permitted power exchange between two zones in the day ahead market. So the ITC is defined for each pair of neighbor uh, neighboring market zones, and there already exists. Uh, different met methodologies for calculating the optimal ITC between um, different market zones, such as flow-based market coupling or net transfer capacity. And but for this feature, we went for a simplified approach in which we uh, add up all the line capacities between two zones, and then we set the share, or in this case, several shares of this trading capacity. And we investigate what happened when we um, when we set different shares and how this affect the prices or the redispatch amounts and the total system cost. Now my colleague will follow up with the rest of the methodologies and present you with some results. So thanks a lot, Alfredo. Um, so let's talk about our approach. Um, we want to simulate the German extra high voltage grid and um, we want to analyze different scenarios with different exchange capacities between the zones. And um, the first step is, um, of course, that we do an economic dispatch. And afterwards, we perform cost minimum redispatch to, to get a good uh, feasible dispatch result. And uh, finally, we compare the results for these different scenarios we simulate. And we we analyze, um, we, we simulate the year 2019 in an hourly resolution, and we have three different scenarios. So in each of the scenarios, the 100%, 60 and 20%, we take this share of the physical line capacity between the zones and give it to the day ahead market as exchange capacity between the zones. So it's fixed value. And um, this is true for, for, the uh, for the borders inside Germany. And um, we perform the simulation with a um, power market tool, which is called Prometo, and it was developed by Richard Weinhold and Robert Mead in 2020. So um, let's look at the results. Um, first, have a look on redispatch, on redispatch amount. And um, we split this graph and the positive redispatch and negative redispatch. And you see the results for the different scenarios. So 100% has high exchange capacity between zones and 20% has low exchange capacity between zones. And you see the five different zones. And uh, we see positive redispatch in the south and in the west of Germany. In the south, um, mostly hard coal is used, while in the west, it's um, mostly lignite. Um, negative redispatch we have in all of the zones except for the south, and it's almost only wind energy that is affected by negative redispatch. So if we decrease the exchange capacity to 60, we see that in the east and northeast, uh, negative redispatch uh, is decreasing, and uh, also the positive redispatch in the south is decreasing. But in the northwest and in the west, it stays almost constant. And uh, if we decrease our exchange capacity even further, we, we see the same effect. In the east, north, east, and south, a uh, patch disappeared almost. But in the northwest and west, there's still a redispatch remaining. And um, in, in northwest, there's still wind, wind energy that is mm, yeah, shut down. And um, the fact that only in the west, there's positive redispatch shows you that there's a bottleneck between northwest and west in Germany. And also, the fact that positive and negative redispatch in the West occurs tells you that, there's, that there are bottlenecks inside the Western zone. So overall, we can say lower exchange capacities between the zones lead to a decrease in redispatch, but um, there are still some bottlenecks remaining in the grid that are not addressed by 
by the limitation of the exchange capacities. When we look at um, average market prices, so before redispatching, and if we look at the average over the whole year, uh, which we can see here, um, we see that for the 100% scenario with high exchange, the differences between the zones are rather small. They're under two euros per megawatt hour. The highest prices we have in the south, followed by the west, and the other three zones are yeah, have almost similar prices. And when we decrease the exchange capacity, um, the, the gap is, is widening only slightly for 60%, but for 20% interzonal um, trading capacity, we have um, uh, a bigger split between the zones. And uh, four of the five zones have decreasing prices with less exchange between the zones, but the South um, sees higher prices. And um, th the reason is that um, prices split in hours when renewable feed in is regionally different. In the South, we have mostly PV power installed and only a few wind power plants and a lot of demand. And um, most of the wind generation is in the north and east. So if there's high wind generation in north and east in Germany, um, the south is demanding this wind energy. But if the exchange capacity is low, um, not all of the, the cheap renewable energy can be transported there. So prices are quite high in the south. If there's a lot of PV feed in, um, prices in the south and in, in the other zones are almost similar. We see that in several hours. Um, but it, it always depends where the renewable, gen, re, renewable energy is generated. And um, in the Northwest and Northeast, we even see some hours when both zones are fully supplied by renewables. So prices are very low, they're around uh, zero euros per megawatt hour. Um, if we take a closer look at the seasonality of the, the market prices, we can see for high exchange capacities, the, the trends and uh, how market prices behave in the different zones are, are quite similar, with high prices in the winter and low in the summer. But if we have low exchange capacities, we see that the behavior of the uh, southern zone is different. And there's a lot more stronger seasonality in the south as in the other four zones. Um, the winter prices are significantly higher as in the rest of Germany. And um, as I already said, um, it's, it's linked to the re installed renewable generation. In the winter, you have only little PV generation and uh, the wind energy cannot be transported completely in the south with low exchange capacities. So you see a lot more higher prices here. Um, if we look at the overall system costs, um, we can see if we compare them, that um, the changes between the different scenarios are almost negligible. So what do the overall costs consist of, of generation, curtainment, and redispatch costs? And um, the difference between the scenarios is only around 30 million euros. So it's pretty small compared to the total total amount. Um, the generation costs, they increase slightly when exchange capacity decreases. Um, and on the other hand, redispatch and containment costs, they decrease with decreasing exchange capacity because these limited exchange capacities, they address redispatch, the lower redispatch, so costs are lower too. But these cost reductions and redispatch are compensated by higher generation costs. The only thing that changes is the cost allocation between the zones. So the South has to pay more for the overall system costs if exchange capacity is lower because um, yeah, prices, prices are higher or getting higher in the South. So um, to conclude, we see that limited trading capacities or exchange capacities to influence the electricity system. Um, redispatch um, can be addressed and can be reduced with limited um, exchange capacities between the zones but um, market prices, they increase in regions with, um, with few renewable energy or when re re renewable energy is scarce. So mostly in the south of Germany, um, but these effects, they kind of compensate each other and the overall system costs, they stay kind of the same. So 
this is a starting point for our research. And what we what we want to do is um, take a look in the future. And um, as an outlook, we want to look at 2030 and see what will happen if uh, renewable shares increase and what will happen if the transmission grid changes further or if the extension of the renewable if the extension of the transmission grid is delayed so um, are effects still kind of negligible on the on the overall system costs or do we see stronger effects and stronger trends so thank you for your attention and um, yeah feel free to ask questions Hey, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Alfredo, Christophe. Uh, it was an amazing presentation. I was really surprised while trying to understand the different correlations you have uh, analyzed, which is the this inverse correlation between the redispatch needs together with the interconnection that you have uh, between the zones. So. Uh, while waiting for any questions on the, I mean, so first, is there any question on the audience? Raise your hand. Uh, Thomas, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you give, gave a try at uh, some automated methods for defining uh, zonal configurations, maybe clustering or these kind of things that we can find in the literature. Um, I think it's interesting because you're focusing mostly on most congestion lines, uh, but uh, uh, it may be interesting to to see these methods for like more, um, let's say, extensive approach approaches where you compare prices or maybe even uh, um, market liquidity or this kind of things. So, did you try automating your your zone clustering process? We, we didn't automate it. Um, we, we discussed about it because we saw these approaches of first doing some kind of location and margin pricing and then clustering um, by, the, by the prices. But um, we saw also some research from, from Germany and we had a feeling like, okay, this kind of closely relates to the, to the grid bottlenecks we can see. And uh, we, let's say we, we're more trusted on our engineering intuition to to draw these to draw these borders, so right. it would be it would be interesting to, to investigate that and to see if things change. And we saw that not all the borders are perfectly drawn because between northwest and west there's still some kind of, of redispatch and some some bottlenecks. So um, yeah, that's what I can say about it. All right, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, well. well. While we are waiting for the question, I have like a couple of them. So uh, here, and it's linked with the previous one uh, from Thomas. Uh, so basically, what did you choose five zones or, and have you analyzed to split them in 10 or something like that? So, so do you have any feeling on how, I mean, the, I mean, the, the smaller the regions, which will be the effect? Well, well, there is a there is there is a lot of re research um, how to split uh, in Germany in several markets, and it has been stated that once you there is a point when you start increasing um, the zones and you don't see any significant changes, so we try to keep it them short as we can, but still look for the bottlenecks because that's the point where prices start to diverge from one zone to the other. So um, yeah, at the, I mean, for now we have this own configuration. We're very happy with it. And of course, I mean, if some research come along and said like, okay, let's split them further and further, especially if we are um, in, in our outlook to the year 2030, that we also look for the grid expansion and we, what changes are coming to the grid, then the sun or sun configuration might change. Or look different. Thank you. And the second question is that, I mean, I mean, for sure you will have a knowledge of, uh, let's say, different other countries in Europe. So, uh, I mean, do you think this uh, uh, problematic that you face in, the, in Germany because of this unbalanced of renewable technologies that you have north-south, that this is something that also happens in other European countries or, and therefore, I mean, this kind of analysis would be merit to compute in these countries? 
I mean, we already see, the, I mean, as, as we know, we already see these approaches in, I don't know, in Italy or, or in Sweden or, or these countries where they were actually splitting and they have different zones and where they have this kind of issues. So um, I think, yes, um, it might be interesting. And I mean, what, what we left out in this analysis is the, the other European countries, which actually play a, a big role when it comes to, to flows in a transmission grid in Germany. So um, this would be a good point to, to go deeper and to also connect it to other countries and maybe also to extend analysis to split even other countries into zones. So yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I, I don't know to, to be honest too much about how it's in France or, or in Poland, if, if there's kind of these issues, but uh, I know it from the countries where they already did market splitting like, like Italy or, or Sweden. So maybe you can add on that. Yeah. No, I think that will be like a good point. And my final question is that, uh, I mean, it's about the timing that you mentioned. I mean, you are studying 2019, then you are now focusing on 2030. So, I mean, these steps uh, of running like one decade ahead, um, how, let's say, I mean, in this kind of analysis, how accurate it is on these 10 years or five years or 20 years. Because at the end, I think these, I mean, your, your let's say your problem is somehow biased by renewable energy integration or plans, but also the, the uh, how the, let's say, high voltage network is, is improving or, or increasing, no? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, about the timing, what do you think? It's, uh, so 10 years, it's something fair. Can you do some analysis for 2050 or? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's very difficult. And not only those variables you just mentioned, but also the demand will also be different. And especially yeah. Yeah. with the introduction of uh, electromobility, this um, this changed completely the, the game. And um, we kind of, take that into consideration. Of course, everything is a prediction and everything is subject to many changes. Um, but uh, we mainly take the, the potentials for construction um, for, for building new uh, renewable energies. And we start from that. And uh, of course, we take uh, a lot of research from, uh, from different sources. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a uh, it's, 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 it's a hypothesis or, or uh, what we think of it will be become in, in 10 years or in 25 years. Yeah, and I think for 2050, it's, I think you have to do something like including um, grid expansion internally in your optimization problem. So the, maybe the, it, it will be optimized by itself because yeah, there are no plans yet for 2050 and to, we all really don't know what will happen. I think there will be big changes in the grid. So I think for 2030, it's okay because there are grid development plans and you can somehow say, okay, there, there are plans, but um, yeah, for 2050, it's really hard and it's, you, you have to model it somehow of how the grid will develop. And then I think things are getting a bit complicated and not, yeah, you cannot really tell will it happen or will it not, how, how secure is it, but I think it's worth trying it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so thank you. I think, uh, thanks for the answers. I, I don't know, Thomas, do you have another question? Yeah. Sorry, just a very quick question. Uh, do these zones uh, correspond to the control areas of the different TSOs in Germany? Is it something you took in, into consideration when uh, defining your, your experience-based uh, scenario? I think the only control area you can see here is at one of 50 hertz in the east, but um, yeah, the other ones and Amprion kind of, but yeah, as we know, like Tenet is like this, so it's yeah. a pretty weird control area of, of Tenet and also Transcend PV is pretty small, so no, we, we, didn't, we didn't take it into account because my feeling is this control areas, maybe it could, you, you could redefine them also, let, let's say it like this. I mean, this is historically grown by who owned the network, so we, we didn't take it that much in account. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I think 
maybe we can move on to the next uh, paper. So Alfredo, Christophe, uh, really thank you for the discussion for the paper. And uh, now let's move on, let's say some kilometers away to, to Paris, I guess, Emily. So uh, now we will talk about something about flexibility that also connects with the previous paper. So the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen there? Perfect. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm Emily Little, and I'm a PhD student. I'm working with RTE, the French Transmission System Operator, and Centra Subelic. And I'm here to present my work on um, how we're working to enlarge the flow-based domain in the European Dyad market through the full integration of grid flexibilities and costly remedial actions. Um, so I'll start and give a bit of context, uh, specifically on remedial actions and grid flexibility, um, and a bit on the day ahead market the European day ahead market. Um, and then I'll go into the multi-domain approach, which is how we're, which is the name of the method we're using to expand the flow base uh, domain. And then I'll demonstrate the method on a very small case study. Um, so when we talk about remedial actions, we're talking about a few different things. So we have some costly actions, which is notably redispatch, uh, where we change the generation closer to real time um, but then we also have many non-costly actions, uh, such as phase shifting transformers or HVDC lines where we can control the flow. Um, and I'm going to focus a lot on topology changes in this talk. So um, this includes anything like switching a line in and out of service, or it could be um, activating a switch within one bus of the network as well. Um, to, to either merge or split it and to change the topology of the network. Um, this problem is traditionally much more difficult to model. It's a huge combinatorial problem. Um, and while phase shifting transformers, in order to be optimized, sometimes require binary variables as well, they are, they've been pretty successfully linearized in the literature. Um, whereas transmission switching, you, it, it requires binary variables. So if we look at this in the literature, it's known as either the optimal transmission switching or optimal topology control problem. Uh, it was introduced in the 1980s as a method to correct overloads uh, after N minus one events. So after like, outages in the network. There's a nice quote by Mazi from 1986, where essentially uh, they looked at, they calculated a corrective action for a specific overload in the system using a linear program um, and this resulted in a shift in the generation. And then they give the same contingency condition to a system operator whose initial response was simply to switch the network, um, which relieved the overload and allowed the generation to remain the same. So it's, it can be sometimes a, um, a different way to, to assess the situation um, other than redispatch. So up until the early 2000s, this problem was mainly analyzed in a from the perspective of resolving the problem and um, and really like generating heuristics to reduce the, the problem size and things like in this nature. But in 2005, O'Neill proposed dispatchable transmission asset auctions. And so then we see uh, a huge piece of the literature that focuses on um, co-optimizing the topology of the network with the generation. So often these were two-stage optimization problems with a unit commitment where the generation was fixed and then um, an optimal transmission switching problem where the topology was fixed and some sort of iteration between these two. And a variety of studies um, in the 2000s and 2010s, some on nodal, some on zonal markets, found between 3 and 25% total cost savings on um, in different studies between 1 and 24 hour time periods. Um, earlier this year, we worked on a study to um, sort of analyze how this cost saving would, would evolve as we have more renewables in the situation and as the system becomes more, more variable and more uncertain. So for this study, we looked at three different variations of the DC optimal power flow problem, one with optimal transmission switching, one without. Um, and then we also had a copper plate model with no transmission constraints just to get an idea of the, the cost of congestion in, in this system, which was a 74 bus test. Um, 
system. And what's important is this um, total cost difference on the right plot. If you look at the blue curve, we have the difference between the OTC and no OTC case. And this is the sum of the costs over a full year. And we can see that the difference really significantly increases as we add wind into the system. So this grid flexibility is going to become more and more valuable as our systems become more, more variable. So just to give a bit of background on the day ahead market, um, currently in Europe, we have this, this zonal market. Um, so we have, um, I guess, the price coupling of regions where um, the different countries in Europe are combined into one algorithm. So all of the, the purchase and sale offers for the majority of European countries are submitted to one algorithm, the FEMIA algorithm, um, which associates purchase and sale offers while maximizing the social welfare or the sum of the profits earned by all of the agents. And there are a few different constraints on this problem. Um, everything sold is purchased. This is insured across all of the zones that are connected by one common border. Then we have the border constraints, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, and then, of course, the total amount of power accepted is within the range that's offered uh, for each order. And out of this algorithm, we get the accepted quantities and the market clearing price, one for each zone, or um, which generally aligns with the countries in Europe, besides some exceptions. So as I said, I'm going to be focusing on this border constraint piece of the Euphemia algorithm. Um, we currently have two different methods in Europe for, 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 using the, for assigning these constraints. Historically, we've used the available transfer capacity method, where the TSOs determine a, um, a single value, a single net transfer capacity uh, that can be assigned during the day ahead market clearing for each direction on each border. And in this method, each interconnection is independent from the others. So it doesn't capture the effects of loop flows, for instance. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I have a puppy here, so. Um, so currently we use the flow based region in central Western Europe, and this is going to be extended very soon to the for, full core region. So including central Eastern Europe as well. Uh, and with this method, it sort of approaches a bit more the physical reality of the network. So we define um, a convex polyhedron, a, a security domain uh, from linear inequalities. And we do this using two, two elements uh, of the grid. We have what's known as the critical network elements, which are the network elements that are influenced the most by the cross-border exchanges. And we have the power transfer distribution factors, uh, the PTDFs, which show how an exchange between two of the zones would affect the flow along each of these, these network elements. And a network element can be either a branch or a transformer. It can be anything within the system. So just to get a little bit of an idea um, of how this works, of how the flow based really uh, translates commercial flows into physical flows, we have this PTDF matrix, which has the, those factors I was discussing. Um, and this shows how this 100 megawatt commercial flow between B and A, for instance, would be translated into the actual lines of the network. So because not all of it will obviously flow between zones B and A, some of it will flow through C and D as well. And so we have these factors which, which show how this flow will be separated along each, each line in the system. Um, so this gives this orange domain here, um, the shape here, which if we compare it to the ATC uh, method for the same level of risk, uh, we, have a, we have a larger space um, a larger amount of exchanges between European countries that's available to the day ahead market clearing. So we step back a little bit and look at the capacity calculation, the, the flow based method. Um, there are a variety of perspectives here. So at the European level, there's a desire to really uh, increase the size of the domain to allow for more integration of the markets and allow for more uh, exchanges between countries. And to have these domains updated more frequently in order to increase the overall European social welfare. Um, so there are a few policies that are, are coming into play right now, specifically to increase the size of the domain given to the day ahead market thing. 
from the TSO perspective, this should be done while limiting deviations between the market output and what's actually going to occur in the network, the physical reality. Um, and that's to ensure the system security while uh, we're in a context of increasing uncertainties and increasing variability from uh, the rise of, of renewable energies. And all this should also be done with some sort of full transparency um, so that market participants can anticipate the market prices uh, that they'll be seeing. The objective of this study is therefore to develop a methodology to integrate grid flexibility and other remedial actions into the existing European flow rates market uh, that are consistent with the day ahead market outcome. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that in the next section. So if we zoom in on the flow-based calculation on, on the operational timeline, the actual calculation begins at 7 p.m. two days before real time. So two days before any electricity will be, will be delivered. Uh, and there are a few different phases that I want to discuss about here, notably the merging and the adjustments. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but it's important to note that the, the first calculation of a flow-based domain, this, this convex polyhedra, is at 8 p.m. two days before real time. There are some adjustments made over the night uh, between this, this first calculation and the day ahead market clearing. Um, and the final calculation is done for um, 9.30, one day before delivery, one, one day before real time. And we get these two parameters out of this calculation. We get the power transfer distribution factors that I discussed before and the remaining available margin, which is the amount that's left on each of the critical network elements that's available to be allocated during this phase of the market. And then within the market clearing, we optimize the uh, social welfare within this domain um, for the whole system. So if we look at the merging a bit closer, uh, this is the, the phase that happens at the very beginning at 7 p.m. to do for real time. Each TSO gives a forecast of the generation demand and the network state that they expect in real time. And this is based on a forecast market direction. So what that refers to a set of imports and exports of all bidding zones. So how much France would export to Germany, um, et cetera. And then each of these forecasts is merged into a single state uh, and from that, we calculate this initial domain, uh, where here we have the axes are the net positions of the different countries. So it's obviously in more than two dimensions in reality. In the adjustment stage, there are a few different things taken into account. For one thing, the long-term markets come into play here, um, and the flow based domain would be adjusted for any, any prior nominated flows. Um, and there's also a phase of remedial action optimization that occurs. So here I've depicted sort of how a change of a, a phase shifting transformer tap change would affect the domain and how a topological switch would also affect the domain. So this would be, again, switching a line in and out of service or changing the topology some way. So during this phase, uh, the goal of the TSOs is to in is to expand the flow-based domain in this forecast market direction. So here it's represented by this, this pink point and the arrow. Um, and so throughout the night, the TSOs sort of coordinate to expand it in this specific direction. So here we can see on the, in the initial domain we had in purple, we expand it um, and it, we have more room in this sector of the domain where both countries are, are exporting, for instance. And what we can see is that this is going to also limit the domain, the size of the domain in all the other, in generally um, in the majority of the other directions, because we're sort of displacing the domain in one direction. So here's a short, here's a little summary of what I was just describing. We start with this initial calculation, we have a forecast market direction, and then we expand it as far as we can in that direction. But if we had a different market direction forecast in the second phase, we could take this first initial domain and expand it in a different direction and end up with a different final, final flow-based domain. And the same thing would happen if we had a different forecast in the input data. So this, this shows how, um, how dependent the flow-based domain is on good, um, good forecast data. 
Um, and so the idea of the multi-domain approach is to actually incorporate these, these three different domains or these multiple different domains um, in the market clearing algorithm. And I'll get into how we do that in the next section. Um, but the idea here is really to, to be able to increase the cross-border capacity that's available to the market. And the, the market itself will choose which set of, um, of coherent remedial action. So that includes the topology, that includes the, the phase shifting transformer tap positions, which set of those uh, it would is the best uh, in terms of European social welfare. This also increases the transparency to a certain extent for market participants um, regarding the grid flexibility actions, because as I was saying, these are actions that TSOs, transmission system operators are using, um, but not necessarily in a, in a manner that's uh, exposed to all market actors. So this is a way to, to have it be uh, more transparent to all the participants, and we can increase the system security uh, using this method. So I just wanted to demonstrate it with a very simple case study. We just have the, the three zones that we're modeling here and we're not modeling them with an internal network for the moment. So any of the, the network elements we're looking at are these cross-border lines. Uh, in this example, we have two production offers in France and Belgium with France having the cheaper offer and we have a demand offer in, in Germany. And we're going to look at how we implement this with two different topologies in the system. So if we look at the first one and we're looking at this, this red line there, uh, we have, this is what, this is how the, the flow-based constraint would, would look in this case. So we'd have the PTDF factors, the power transfer distribution factors of two thirds and one third multiplied by the net position. So how much France or Belgium is importing or exporting depending on the sign. And this value must be less than or equal to the amount that's available to the market, the remaining available margin on this, this red line. If, however, we look at this other case where there's um, a second line between France and Belgium, this red line actually has a different, um, a different constraint. So we have different factors uh, multiplied here. We have three fifths and two fifths instead of two thirds and one third. And if we visualize this in the domain, we see these two different lines. We see the light blue and the dark blue line and these two pink areas where if we chose one of the topologies in advance, we would only have one of those two pink areas. So the idea here is pretty simple. We introduce a binary variable epsilon multiplied by um, a value M, which is just much larger than the, the margin on the line. Um, so for instance, if the market coupling algorithm chooses a value of one for this variable, the light blue line will be displaced away from the, the domain and will be rendered non-constraining. Um, and the same thing for the dark blue line if the value is zero. So this is how we can include these multiple domains in the market clearing algorithm. Um, we wanted to go ahead and test it in Euphemia. So instead of introducing exactly like this, we had to sort of find a trick um, to incorporate it in the existing algorithm. Uh, so in Euphemia, there are binary variables that are associated with block offers. Block offers are any offer that must be either fully accepted or refused. Um, so in order to, to add this, uh, this system in, we incorporate three virtual bidding zones. So we have uh, one demand offer at this virtual zone zero and two block offers, one at one and one at two. And as you can see in the constraint, we add the net position of, the, of each virtual zone to one of the constraints. And so the algorithm can choose one topology or the other by accepting the block offer in the virtual zone, in the respective virtual zone. And here you can see we would end up adding the value big M to, to this constraint, rendering it non-constraining. We ran a few very small case studies in Euphemia already, um, looking at four different topologies here. Uh, so just to show what that would look like, we end up adding five virtual zones uh, to the system, each with a block offer. And uh, in this case where we have, um, obviously we can 
hand calculate that the four, fourth option is the would be that would have to give the highest social welfare because it allows for the most flow. Um, and so in Euphemia, this option was chosen. We also expanded the method a bit to include costly remedial actions. So this is where we would include redispatch directly into the flow based method. Um, and we can do this by associating a cost with each of the domains. So the market clearing algorithm will uh, will arbitrate between this additional cost and any social welfare gain that might be found um, through through the use of this this additional space in the domain. So I won't go into the details uh, because of time, um, but I wanted to go through a little bit of the, the downsides of this method as well. So if we look at the original market coupling constraint, sorry, it's, a, it's like a lot of math, but it's pretty straightforward. We have the PTDF matrix here, which is the number of critical branches or critical network elements um, by the number with the number of columns as, as the number of bidding zones. Um, and when we add in this integration of the different topologies and the different remedial actions, we end up adding the number of, uh, multiplying the number of rows of this PTDF matrix by the number of uh, topologies and remedial action sets that we're including. So it could end up that this matrix becomes really uh, quite large. Um, and then you can see here, this is the number of columns we're adding is the number of virtual zones to the matrix. So this is really the biggest downside to the method that we're still investigating to what point this is, um, this would be restricting, restrictive. Um, so it's possible to perform pre-solve to really reduce the number of rows that we're giving to the market coupling algorithm. And that's what we're working on now using some operational data from Central Western Europe uh, to see at what point this will be constraining in the method. So just to conclude quickly, um, this method allows for increased cross-border capacity available to the market, um, some sort of increased transparency regarding the grid flexibility actions that are, that are already being incorporated, but not necessarily um, in a transparent way. We can also have increased system security, um, but it's likely that this will increase the computational complexity of the, of the system. So that's all I have for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. So thank you very much, Emily. I think it was uh, an impressive work on this flow-based domain and how to integrate this flexibility of the network system. So uh, yeah, now it's time for questions. So I think Christophe, do you have any questions? You raise your hand. No. Ah, I was clapping. So I have I have a couple of questions, uh, Emily. That uh, I guess they, they are quite generic, but I, in order to focus the, the the problem. So I mean, one of the things you mentioned is that uh, you want to stress the transparency of the methodology used for the different countries. So my I have this question. Have two things. The first thing is that do European countries uh, have exactly the same criteria to define the congestions limitations that could be for that. And, you know, following this, um, can, let's say, the, let's say, regional TSOs compute these matrices or is it, is, is it an external, let's say, uh, let's say big TSO in charge of doing that? Okay, so that's, that's something that if there is some, so at the end, the question is that can somebody, I mean, thinking about transparency, can somebody have all the data to adequately compute this information? Um, it's a very good question. And um, I definitely like to do a study using just um, the TYNDP or the 10 year network development plan or something that's open source. To, to get an idea of to what extent this would be possible. I think the hardest part is really to choose the topological actions um, and the PSTs that you would use in the oper use in your in the methodology, because I think that's something that's 
still pretty um, tightly guarded uh, in terms of data. So I will be looking into how good of an estimate we can come to using just open source data uh, in, the method, in the methodology. But what I think is important is that these are actually, these are actions that are already included in the flow-based system as it is. Um, but I think a lot of people don't know that and it can really have a big effect on the market prices coming out of the market coupling algorithm, just the use of these different preventive and curative remedial actions. Okay. Um, I have another question is that, uh, I mean, when you have these different, uh, let's say, flow based domains where you, let's say, try to identify a specific area of or domain. I mean, mm -hmm. is there, I mean, uh, from, I mean, it's from your knowledge, the shaded area, uh, has it a specific meaning for that? So whenever you are doing something, this area is changing the area itself uh it's changing so is this area does this area means something um i mean it definitely does mean something but it does have a lot of to do with the um, input data the forecast data that we're giving it um so obviously if we have a really inaccurate forecast the domain may not mean as much as we would like um so for this okay. study i'm really the one where I'm using the operational data from Central Western Europe. Um, I'm looking specifically at days where this forecast was, uh, was really different, significantly different from the actual real time, uh, what actually happened in real time. Uh, so the, the goal of that study is to really analyze at what point do we have these, these inconsistencies in the, the forecast data? How does this affect the domain? Um, could be that the forecast is generally pretty good and, and we don't necessarily need the multi-domain approach even. Um, but I think given that the flow-based region will be moving to, to the whole core region, the whole central, western, and eastern Europe, this forecast is likely to, um, the quality is likely to degrade a bit with that move. Uh, and I think it'll be more important to incorporate a variety of strategies. Okay. Okay, and my final question is that, um, I mean, the example you presented is like, let's say it's a very simple case study, yeah. but you know, it's enough to, let's say, so easily this complex, uh, let's say methodology or, or formulation. So if, if, if you are thinking about, let's say, scaling up your analysis into real uh, systems, uh, which are the barriers or the things that you uh, think will be difficult or, or you will need to think about? Um, so one of the things, if, it, if we really want to use it operationally, one of the hardest things will be, um, you see when I have this slide here, it mm -hmm. really multiplies the, the steps that we have to do operationally by the number of um, domains that we want to use. And already, I think it's quite a complicated process. So the, it would, I think the duplication of this process for the different domains would be tricky. Um, but it also depends on how we are planning to define them. So I'm looking at a few different ways of defining them using either um, more of a sort of data analysis approach where I do, where you do a study across a full year and you do a clustering of different likely domains. Um, which I think would be, it would be more work in advance, but during the actual operational period would be doable. Um, and then I'm also looking at a different method where we, sh we shift the generation in the, the forecast. So that before the merge phase, we shift the, the generation to, um, you know, more exports from, from Germany or, or more right. exports from France, and and then we calculate the domain using these different shifts, shifted forecasts. Um, okay, okay, thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. So, another question in the virtual room. So, Thomas, your turn. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering if you if there could be topological actions including HVDC lines or like hybrid part, hybrid part of the grid with the HVDC and 
uh, HVAC lines? Um, yeah, so actually the HVDC lines are already um, being integrated into the flow-based method right. uh, in a similar way to this using the virtual bidding zone strategy. Um, so I think that's, I don't know if this is answering your question, but I think that's really the- Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah the I, I was just wondering, and um, can it add like, uh, like um, I know Germany is considering having more HVDC lines in the future because they are trying everything to reduce congestion, splitting yeah. uh, building, building zones, integrating more HVDC lines. So would it add more uh, computational complexity? Um, to, it to would, more, if, we, if we use the current method for the HVDC lines, uh, the, you know, with each, as far as I'm aware, with each HVDC line, we add a virtual zone um, yeah. to control it completely. Um, but with this method, we're using more discrete um, okay. options. So the thought would be more that we optimize the, the set of all of the HVDC lines together in okay. one direction, get the, the flow for that specific market direction and for that specific flow-based domain that would be the best. Um, and then rather than you know, including each HVDC line as a different column in the PTF matrix, we would just include one new column um, for the set okay. of, of the optimal set points. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any other questions in the room? Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Emily. That was, uh, oh, sorry, Steffi. Okay, Steffi was clapping hands, sorry. I yes. still, I'm not used to, to Zoom in that way. Okay, so thank you very much, Emily. So now it's going to uh, take place also to move back to Germany again, to Dresden. So uh, Steffi will, uh, will present his paper talking about demand response and its value on uh, European markets. So uh, the floor is yours, Steffi. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction um, and welcome from my side. My name is Steffi Miskonal and I'm a research associate uh, from the Technical University of Dresden at the Chair of Energy Economics. And today I would like to present to you a, a research which we conducted together with my colleagues Christoph Zöfel and Professor Dominic Must on the value of flexible electricity demand in a future sector coupled European energy system. So it's not really about, uh, or it's nothing about the electricity grid, but about demand response. At the beginning, I would like to introduce you briefly to the agenda. I would like to say something about the motivation and background of our study and the increasing need for power system flexibility on the supply and demand side. In the second step, I will introduce you to our scenario framework and the main input parameter for our electricity market model, Ultramod. In a further step, I will quantify the value of demand response and its impact on different components in the electricity system. And finally, I will draw some conclusions and underline the significant value of demand response. To diminish the consequences of climate change and to keep the temperature increase below 1.5 degrees, the European Union set with the European Green Deal the overarching aim of making Europe climate neutral until 2050. And regarding the emission reduction target, the power sector plays a crucial role as the sector is responsible for 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Europe. And for a sustainable transition, very high shares of renewable energy sources have to be integrated into the electricity system. And this will lead to high fluctuations in the electricity supply. Additionally, the electrification of further demand side sectors or the so-called sector coupling increases the importance of ambitious decarbonization measures for the electricity sector. And this will necessitate necessitate balancing of the electricity supply and demand and thus the increasing need um, for power system flexibility will occur on the supply and the demand side. Particularly demand response, a subcategory of demand side management is one promising option to increase load flexibility. 
And this is why our objective or the objective of our study is to assess the value of demand response from a system perspective and two different decarbonization pathways. So we considered a decentralized and decentralized European electricity system with 100% renewable energies and sector coupling. Coming to the scenario framework. So the two scenarios, the decentralized and the centralized electricity system for Europe um, are quite different and can be distinguished between the three main categories, um, the renewable energy sources, sector coupling, and the demand response potentials. So we assumed that the decentralized electricity system in Europe is characterized by a stronger deployment of PV rooftop and battery systems. And the centralized system is characterized by a stronger deployment of wind offshore, but both scenarios will have a 100% risk share in 2050. Sector coupling is implemented by modeling power to gas and power to heat, which has to fulfill the hydrogen demand and the district heat demand in both scenarios. Here, the hydrogen demand and the district heat demand is given and is almost twice as high in the centralized scenario compared to the decentralized scenario. Further, the decentralized scenario is characterized by individual small-scale energy sources compared to the centralized scenario, which is characterized by large-scale energy sources. And finally, the demand response potentials are higher in the decentralized scenario because there's a higher participation and higher level of acceptance on local level for demand response applications compared to the centralized scenario where the acceptance is lower. And the higher um, demand response potential is, can, or is mainly characterized by a stronger deployment of battery systems and electromobility. Going a little bit more into detail, um, here we illustrated the installed renewable capacities for the both scenarios. And um, this data is based on a EU Horizon 2020 project called Reflex. And all our input data are open access available in our Reflex data warehouse. So the renewable expansion pathways um, are calculated by geographically highly resolved data on land availability on the generation and the hourly generation profiles for the renewable energies are based on weather data. Further, we have integrated the hourly electricity demand for different countries. And here in this figure, the total electricity demand for the both scenarios as illustrated. And we see that in the decentralized scenario, there's a slightly higher total electricity demand compared to the centralized scenario due to the higher electrification in the industry sector and in the transport sector. The different assumptions regarding the penetration and participation of technologies available for load shifting measures result in significant differences regarding the potential of demand response in the different in the both scenarios. So here we considered 15 different demand response processes in four different sectors. So we consider the industry, the tertiary, the residential and the trans transport sector. And as I mentioned it two slides before, the maximum hourly available demand response potential, which is technically available, is um, higher in the decentralized scenario. And this is mainly due to the higher penetration of electromobility and smart charging of um, electric vehicles, as well as because of the higher penetration of battery storages. Further, we um, calculated the expansion of power to gas, so water electrolyzers in the centralized scenario model endogenously in Ultramod. This is why it's not shown here as input parameter in this table, but it's, it is um, yeah, slightly, the installation is slightly higher as in the decentralized scenario because of the higher hydrogen demand as we have seen before. All these input parameters are implemented in our fundamental linear optimization and electricity market model, Ultramod, which is NTC based. That means that um, we 
treated every country as one node and, and there is no congestion within one market zone. So Europe is considered as a copper plate. And we integrated in each country different techno-economic parameters um, like the capacities, efficiencies, but also fuel and CO2 prices, then the renewable capacities and their hourly generation profiles, as well as hourly electricity demand per country and the country-specific demand response profiles. The target function is the minimization of the total system costs. And we considered all EU 27 member states, um, including Norway, Switzerland, the United Kingdom and the Balkan countries. And output, as output, we received the electricity prices, but also the optimal investment and dispatch of conventional power plants, as well as for flexibility options and CO2 emissions and um, other important results. So how did we um, implement the optimal dispatch calculation of demand response in our large scale electricity market model? Um, the activation of demand response is here limited to the constraint of the exogenous implemented load profiles that defines the maximum available demand response load increase as an upper bound shown here in equation one. Um, we further considered different sensitivities, so we varied the chair of maximum available demand response potential. So we start with no demand response and then we increase the chair of the potential by in 25% steps until we reach the full available um, potential of demand response. The maximum available demand response low decrease is um, here considered as a lower bound in equation two for every hour and every country. And the further constraint ensures that the total amount of demand response electricity for load increase equals the amount for load reduction. And consequently, the residual load is moved by the cost optimal dispatch of the activated demand response load potential. Regarding the implementation in Ultramod, the activation costs of demand response processes are an influencing component of the target function that minimizes the total system costs. And further, the energy balance is affected by the flexible loads of demand response processes as those processes are influencing the residual load curve. So the residual load curve is smoothed by this flexible load shifting. Coming now to the results. Um, I would like to start with the impact of demand response on the residual load. Um, in the following two figures, uh, the model exogenous input time series are illustrated, which are the residual load without the smoothing effect of the air, which is the black dotted curve here of the two graphs, and the maximum hourly available the air potential, which is the black solid line here in both graphs. In contrast to that, uh, the red lines illustrate the model endogenous results of our calculations. So the smooth residual load with the optimal dispatch of demand response and power to X technologies, which is here the, the red dotted graph in both scenarios and um, the optimal dispatch of demand response for the decentralized and centralized scenario. This is a red solid line. So the residual load without the smoothing effect of demand response is characterized by higher peaks in the hourly mean in the decentralized scenario resulting from higher system loads through the additional electricity demand from sector coupling. However, the hourly demand response potentials for, for load reduction are activated in the early morning and in the evening to decrease uh, capacity deficits in both scenarios. And um, the hourly demand response potential for load increase are activated during the midday hours here in both scenarios, mainly to uh, balance the surpluses of renewable energies, co mainly caused by the high PV field. Also, the model exogenous input parameters are here very different between the two scenarios. The um, figures depict a 
quite similar smooth residual load in the hourly mean. When we compare here the, the two red dotted lines, we see, okay, the, the development is quite, quite similar. And this is due to the, that the moderate shifting, load shifting of demand response here in the centralized scenario is accompanied by large load increase potentials by power to X, so power to heat, but particularly power to gas. And this is why here is a great load increase potential for the residual load. As we have seen before, it was a scenario assumption that the hydrogen demand is um, higher in the centralized perspective. And now the effect of demand response on the conventional and capacity and generation mix. Um, the smoothing effect of the residual load of demand response uh, directly affects the power plant capacity and generation mix in both scenarios. And um, to have a better comparison of both scenarios, as I mentioned it several times now, that the uh, model input is very different. We um, calculated um, a more specific, more specific results. So here we illustrated the absolute change between the different sensitivities um, of different demand response potentials. So 25, 50, 75, and 100% um, compared to the sensitivity without the calculation of demand response related to the maximum potential of each sensitivity. So now with this specific results, we can directly compare the decentralized and centralized scenario um, also if the input parameter are very different. And what we can see here is that um, especially peak and medium load capacities are reduced or substituted by increasing um, demand response um, potentials. So mainly um, combined cycle gas turbines and combined cycle gas turbines with a carbon capture and storage. Due to the lower flexibility demand in terms of less extreme residual load parameters in the wind offshore dominated centralized scenario, the exploitation of the air potentials and the corresponding smooth residual load allows for additional low carbon base load capacities such as nuclear power plants. Furthermore, the results also illustrate that less conventional electricity generation is required with increasing um, demand response potential. This is not shown here in this slide, um, but the picture is similar to the capacity mix. Now the impact of demand response on storage requirements. So in, in this slide, the direct competition between load shifting demand response application and electricities is uh, illustrated. So we considered um, compressed, compressed air and energy storages as well as different kinds of batteries. So redox flow batteries and then different kinds of lithium ion batteries with different energy power ratios and yeah, for the centralized or from a decentralized and centralized uh, system perspective, it is in both scenarios more cost efficient to activate demand response instead of storages due to the advantage regarding lower investment costs and higher efficiency of demand response. And um, for the decentralized case, we can see that here energy storages with a higher energy power ratio, so of um, the compressed air energy storages and the redox flow batteries have an energy power ratio of 10 megawatt hour per megawatt um, are more substituted here in the decentralized system as um, demand response can balance this daily and seasonal fluctuations caused by PV can be balanced more efficiently here in this scenario and um, while short term storages here in the decentralized scenario are still needed um, to a certain extent as the surpluses um, from the midday hours needs to shift, be shifted into the evening hours in the decentralized system. And then the centralized system, all types of different energy storages are substituted in a similar range um, due to demand response. Now the next slide, I think it will load a little bit, yeah. Um, here, the impact of demand response on the integration of volatile in renewable energies is illustrated. So 
curtailment can be reduced by the activation of demand response. Um, the effect is slightly higher here in the decentralized scenario with um, more PV installations. And to analyze the um, competitiveness of volatile renewable energies concerning the activation of increasing demand response potentials, the market value factors of um, wind onshore, offshore, PV ground mounted and PV rooftop power plants is calculated here in, in box plots. So we calculated the market value factors for each considerate country in Europe. And um, what we can observe here is that the market value factors are slightly decreasing in the decentralized scenario. And this is due to the um, high penetration of uh, volatile PV and wind onshore feed in which leads to frequently low or even negative residual load during the day and those to declining electricity prices which results in decreasing market value factors. So um, here in, in this last figure um, on the left side we can see the duration curve of the mean electricity prices for Europe and we see that with an increasing share of demand response potentials the electricity prices decrease. And there's a different effect in the decentralized scenario here, the market value factors remain almost constant. And this is due to the high feed in off and offshore risk, which stabilize the market value factors, while the electricity prices remain almost um, constant and or constant in sense of with increasing demand response potential. And um, the electricity prices are also slightly higher in this scenario. So the last result slide and the impact of demand response on CO2 emission and the total system cost. So due to the activation of demand response, CO2 emissions can be reduced in the electricity sector in both scenarios, while the effect is slightly higher here in the de decentralized scenario. So the additional integration of renewable energies and also the reduced conventional generation leads to this CO2 emission reduction in both scenarios. And um, also the total system cost can be reduced by the activation of um, demand response in both scenarios. Um, again, here the effect is higher in the decentralized scenario as um, there the avoided investments are higher and also the electricity generation by conventional backup and peak load capacity is lower and this leads to higher fuel cost savings and, and lower expenditures of CO2 emission allowances. To conclude some final remarks, we, uh, um, yeah, we illustrated a uh, quite straightforward method to implement demand response um, into a large scale electricity market model. So all our data are open and accessible, available, and um, also the, the, yeah, the model formulation, um, which I presented before is quite um, straightforward and uh, adaptable for every large scale electricity market model, which uh, considers a linear uh, optimization. And our results also confirm earlier findings and underline the significant value of demand response um, by reducing conventional power plants and storage capacities. And compared to the sensitivities without demand response, we also saw that um, the activation of demand response can reduce total system cost and CO2 emissions. So at the beginning, it was quite clear that the two scenarios are very uh, different regarding the assumptions, so mainly due to the expansion pathways of renewable energies and the assumptions regarding the um, demand response potentials. But we illustrated uh, um, yeah, a way or a calculation where both scenarios were directly comparable. And we saw that um, at the end in the decentralized system with high shares of photovoltaic, demand response can balance daily short-term fluctuations more efficiently. And those leads to higher system cost savings and higher CO2 emission reductions. And in, the, in contrast, in the centralized scenario, which is characterized by high penetration of, high penetration of wind offshore power plants, the feed-in is more consistent um, due to wind offshore and the fluctuations are 
strong but short and um, particularly um, there or existing in the evening and night hours when the DR potential is uh, quite low. And this is why the value of demand response is higher in, um, yeah, in an electricity system with um, daily short-term fluctuations um, caused by photovoltaic. Yeah, thank you very much for your intention. And now I'm happy to answer your question. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Steffi. I think the, I mean, the work is impressive. I think, I guess that's, uh, I mean, it's a really huge work behind this, uh, all the information that you show, like, you know, like, like a zip somehow. So I think there is, a, I will ask you later, I mean, for some, if you can share with us some references on the projects and on, on the information, on the information reports that you may have on this, that's, that's quite interesting. So uh, yeah, I leave now the floor to somebody that may have a question, Christoph. So, I mean, yes. You can go yeah, uh, thanks. Very, very impressive work and very, yeah extensive uh, results, lots of results and <clears throat> lots of lots of interesting insights. And um, I have two questions and it's mostly about data. Um, mm. You showed that um, the demand response measurements, they have different costs. Um, can you explain how did you get these costs? Where did you yeah. get them from? Yeah. So I try to open it again. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we um, did a literature review, and um, yeah, we had some some German colleagues which investigated this activation costs before. So there's a dissertation of um, a colleague of mine, Ter Teresa Ladwig from 2018, and Hans Christian Giltz, who is also an expert on demand response. And um, then there was also a study from the University of Aberdeen by uh, Russell McKenna. Who also investigated some activation costs yeah but mainly based on li a literature review and then we estimated um, um, average activation cost for for each um, process and yeah this this was mainly the the approach of this so okay thanks and um, one more question maybe I explained it but maybe, maybe i just missed it and the demand response profiles, how did you, how did you get them like for, yeah. for each hour? Yeah, so this is also based, um, or this is also the result of um, our EU Horizon 2020 uh, project Reflex. Um, yes, we had um, a different um, model, which calculated uh, on the one hand side the hourly electricity demand for each country, but also the hourly uh, maximum available demand response potential for each process. Um, and this is what we used. So this is mainly based on, on other model, model results from, from ELOAD, which is from the Fraunhofer ISI. And they have these processes really detailed in, in their model and calculated the load shift for each process. This was now not possible for our electricity market model because it would be too big, too complex and the computational time would um, accelerate. Um, and this is why we have used this outputs from, from a model coupling, which was um, yeah, done before. And um, this profiles, um, but yeah, more, or less the aggregated profile of all processes per country um, can also be downloaded. So there's not the, the load shifting profile for each single process um, online, but um, for each country and then um, yeah, the aggregated load shift of all this, this processes. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you, Christoph. Now, uh, Manuel. Yes. So, hello, Steffi. Um, quite, quite, quite impressive work. Um, I have a question regarding the formulas. I think it was slide eight or nine or something. Yeah. Um, One moment. 
yeah, 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 exactly there. Um, it's about so so you have like the dr min and dr max, so that means that you have an upper and lower bound, and and uh, the equation to zero. That means over over a year, for example, the upward and downward demand response have to be on the same um, has to be equalized. However, to my understanding, uh, you can do like seasonal demand response. Is it right? Because there's no duration limit that you, because normally I understand uh, demand response more, more as a short-term flexibility, but would it, wouldn't it mean that you do um, uh, a demand response about different seasons or do I get it wrong? Hmm. Um, no, it's, it's the understanding is right. Um, so we have the exactly calculated load shifting by the e-load model. So this is given as a model exogenous input for Ultramod. So mm -hmm. there is um, already given a load shifting potential. And we only wanted to know if this load shifting potential, which was already calculated, um, is necessary to this extent, or if there is a, another optimal dispatch of demand response in, in our model due to the additional flexibility options as storages, power to gas, power to heat, which we calculated. So okay. there, is, there is a profile given. So for every hour, there's a, a maximum um, potential. And then in the, in the next hour, um, a minimum potential. So yeah, there is um, a profile is, is given and you can okay. only optimize within this profile so the you avoid this um, danger that you shift everything from maybe from summer to to winter so okay. this is not possible so you basically say that the rebound effect is uh, uh, exogenously given by this uh, by this e load data um, okay okay thank you yeah so this is why i i also said it's this tr it is straightforward so demand response um, in our model is not really detailed modeled. Uh, it can be in more detail by considering also um, shifting times and duration times of this load shifts. But um, this was already done by this e-load model and we just take, took this uh, already calculated profiles and um, yeah, recalculated in our models if this is really the optimal um, yeah, dispatch of demand response for our case. But um, yeah, the assumptions and also the model input parameters, of course, are all um, harmonized between the models. And um, if you are interested, we also published uh, a book on our project results and there is um, everything described in more detail. And I can also give you the link in the chat afterwards and because it's open accessible and everybody can can download it i i will briefly look for for the link and okay. there are a lot of other interesting topics regarding flexibility great i mean it will be great i mean if uh, i mean you can share the thing in the through the chat so meanwhile, I want to ask you like uh, one easy question, which is, I mean, in the, in, in the modeling that you have of the, uh, of the power system, so have you considered uh, non-supplied energy? Non-supplied energy? In yeah, the so in the equation of the balance of generation demand, and then, you know, basically to understand whether there are some situations where demand response is not enough to cover let's say the deviations that you may face. So then you need to curtail, not generation, but load. Yeah, yeah. we have um, a dummy variable, which is called dump demand. And this is a part of the energy balance. And oh. yeah, it's considered. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a thing that, you know, I mean, uh, I think Manuel commented before, but it's about the, the um, and Christopher, so I think, it's about the characterization of the demand response. I mean, I think it's it's a pity that we don't have, you know, enough detail in the model. I think that's future work to identify 
from the different types of demand response that we have, which is the one that contribute best uh, to the final objective, which is because at the end of the day, this is the way to, let's say, set, let's say, a specific policies or incentives or tarification to move let's say, to really activate demand response. So yeah. in these, let's say, in this line, uh, if you want to, let's say, somehow apply the results that you have from the project into real policy making, do you have any, let's say, proposal for that? Mm, I think the most promising option for demand response um, I hear my echo sometimes, so this is why I speak a little bit strange, <laughs> sorry, um, is to activate the load shifting regarding electromobility and also heat starches. So we have another project where we investigate now it and there's, there are high potentials regarding load shifting and um, also advantages for the electricity system. Um, then, of course, the industry has high potential. Um, for load shifting. Mm. Yeah, but a policy advises it would be more or better if there will be more price incentives for using this demand response. So we notice that for maybe for electromobility and also the heat pumps, um, there are price incentives missing. Um, especially in the residential and tertiary sector. So we so need more flexible, flexible price tariffs for the consumers that they're really interested also to, to activate this load shifting. So for the industry, I think there are already um, some measures and some advantages and incentives, but for the other sectors, um, there are yeah, measures missing. Yeah, okay. So in, in sec, I mean, just to finish my, my, my question is that uh, from the final results you, you show in the, in the conclusion, not in the conclusions, yeah, in the conclusions, in the slide 17, uh, you indicate this like a couple of numbers, 50, 50, 55 and 35, yeah, 39, which are, let's say, the, the, I mean, the real value behind the activation of demand response. So so if if you compare these with uh let's say the or or have you compared this with the investments or i mean required for the activation of demand in in the different countries in order just to verify that this is comparable or, or that this is let's say is so high or so low that maybe it has no sense to activate we can use another options mm. so so um, if we compared it to the investments in demand response, or, uh, yeah, the investment in demand response are neglected in our calculations, but um, they are quite low because if there exist already a power to heat or heat pumps, electric vehicles, um, you only need um, a, a measurement or something or a, a little a toolbox which allows you to um, charge your electric vehicle very smart and um, yeah this costs are uh, quite low the investment cost okay no because i mean i remember from previous projects like let's say many years ago some called address project which was a, a european project on that and at the end of the day they they summarized that you know the the savings for a, for instance for a domestic consumer was the cost of a coffee a day so it's like one euro a day, the savings that you can get. So, and at that time, we believe that this was not enough money to really activate the demand response at the consumer side. So that was because of that time, maybe the cost of electricity didn't work, I mean, was not able to, to react. So that was my question. I mean, if, if somehow, uh, I mean, if your feeling is what you mentioned is that, okay, this cost is really fair good enough to really activate demand response, which is something that we, we are all looking for somehow. Mm. 
Yeah, no, you're right. In the moment, as I said before, the incentives for the consumers to really activate it is, are, are very low. So in the, I think in the next years, there, there will be policy measures and price incentives to um, use this demand response potential more. And so that it generates not only in the system perspective, but also for single consumers uh, a value. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, it's missing or not fully exploited. OK. So uh, so thank you, Steffi. I don't know. I think there is no more questions on the, on the room. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I would really like to thank you, uh, Steffi, Emily, Alfredo, Christophe, and of course, Thomas, for assisting us in the during all the session. So it was a pleasure for me to I mean, to know about your work and to discuss your work, which is really interesting and really promising. So I, let's say, keep on working on that. And yeah, and it's a pity we cannot see, let's say, face by face. So, I mean, we will keep in touch and for sure there will be time to meet in person and, and to keep on talking on the thing. So the best for all of you and take care during these strange times and Keep safe, right? Thank you very much. So, thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.